Hello, everyone. Welcome to this webinar, The Artist's Guide to Copyright, Legal Insights for Protecting Your Work. And then I'm going to jump in with introductions. So my name is Cassidy. I'm on the product education team here at Artwork Archive. I have MJ Bogotten with us, uh, but everyone knows him as Bo. So he's a founding member of the San Francisco law firm, Bogotten, Corman and Gold. His arts and entertainment law practice includes all kinds of arts and intellectual property matters, visual, literary, performing, film, multimedia. He regularly handles large-scale public art commission contracts, as well as visual artists' moral rights claims. So he has training and experience as a mediator. He served on the boards of directors of several Bay Area nonprofit arts organizations and is a longtime officer of California Lawyers for the Arts. So he speaks often at legal workshops on copyright, trademark, contract issues for artists. He's the perfect man for the job. Uh, in 2002, he co-authored the sixth edition of the Legal Guide for the Visual Artist book, 300 pages on copyright, contracts, licensing, taxes, and estate planning. So these are all the topics that are critical to the success of the professional visual artist, and it is available online or through your neighborhood bookstore. I actually have my copy here, and it's so helpful. We're so glad to have you, Bo. Thank you. We have a few more things, and then we're going to dive in. So I always love to give the lay of the land. Uh, this is kind of what we're going to walk through. We're going to go a quick about Artwork Archive, because so many of you are joining and have never heard of Artwork Archive, so giving you context. Then we're going to walk through understanding copyright basics, and then copyright registration, enforcement, um, and then we'll have a Q&A and we'll send you, or we'll show you some resources and further free support for artists. Uh, we'll also provide the slides from this presentation as well in the follow-up email. You'll get it all. But a little history. So if you're brand new to Artwork Archive, we began in 2010 as one, as the, one of the first cloud-based art inventory systems. So we provide artists with the tools to manage their inventory, grow their careers. And what I'm really passionate about is protecting their artistic legacies. So this is owning your own story as an artist. This is knowing exactly where your artwork is at all times. I love this visual. Essentially, it's just taking this, which could also represent your mind, which it did for me before having an inventory system and turning it into this. So because we're cloud-based, you can access your inventory on any device that you have the internet on, tablet, phone, saves time on administrative work. You can quickly share your work with collectors, gallerists. You can make all sorts of reports um, and it really helps you establish professional credibility. We're serving artists in over 130 countries worldwide. And we also have a collector version and an art organization version. And then before we go to all of the copyright, I also love for all of those using Artwork Archive, I find it really helpful to directly connect. Here's my inventory system. Here's exactly how this, um, I can use Artwork Archive to protect my work in terms of copyright and you know creative ownership. So these are just a few points that, again, I'll share this slide with you at the end, but just so your mind can know and be thinking about this. So first and foremost, you can comprehensively document your works and have a reliable digital backup of your entire portfolio, your entire career. Um, you can generate certificates of authenticity. So that's another way that you can create and store these to specify, you know, copyright ownership of sold works and clarify the rights for each piece. Um, record keeping. So with each piece record, you can log your creation date. You can even log your copyright filing dates. So in your piece records, in the notes, you can keep track of this is when you filed the copyright if you did that. Um, financial management, you know, keep track of those copyright registration expenses. You can even add that expense to the specific artwork pieces so that you're always knowing how much everything is costing. And then you can privately share your work. So you can password protect private rooms, public profiles, whatever you're sharing your work with clients, you can always protect it. Um, image management, so you can store your high resolution images, but then they're always automatically downsized for the web. So it can ensure that you're you know, secure when sharing your artwork. 
And then you can always add a footer to your public profile. So add that copyright footer. Um, I just wanted to spit all that out because I find it helpful. And then now I am going to pass the mic over to Bo, who is going to just fill our brains with all the information that we need to know to feel empowered about how to protect our own work. Sorry about those dings. Um, they may come through a bit during the presentation as well. I've tried to turn them off. We can't hear them at all. Oh, good. All right. Uh, thanks for your introduction, Cassidy. As, as my introductory statement indicates, my law practice is entirely arts oriented and I love what I do. There's something new and creative for me to deal with every single day. And then when I was asked to revise Tad Crawford's law guide for the visual artist for the sixth edition last year, it really helped me consolidate most of what I know about the visual arts legal uh, world. So um, I invite you all to get a copy of that. I'm sure you will have good reason to use it in service of whatever you do as a visual artist. Uh, it includes chapters on copyright and uh, all the other uh, uh, issues that a visual artist will need to deal with. Uh, it is intellectual property that underlies all visual arts rights matters. So the subject of copyright is the intellectual property interest that protects your visual art and other creative works and which you need to know about. Legally, copyright, the copyright slide should be coming up, is the right accorded to a creator of an original work of authorship fixed in a tangible medium. It applies to creative expression of the artist, for visual artists, that's the imagery that you create by whatever means you create it. Copyright is distinct from the physical object, the painting itself, in which the copyright, the imagery, is embodied. It means that the copyright applies to the image in the painting, not the painting itself, or the text of a book, not the book itself. Now, the Federal Copyright Act, next slide, which is Title 17 of the U.S. Code, expressly identifies the listed works eligible for copyright protection. These are, as indicated, literary works, musical, dramatic, pantomimes, choreographic works, pictorial, graphic, and sculptural works, which are particularly pertinent for you visual artists, as well as film and other audiovisual works. It's also applied to compilations of these works so they can put to, be put together and registered as a group. Next slide. There are exceptions to what is eligible for copyright protection. The first that I wanna talk about is the expression versus idea dichotomy. Copyright applies only to expressions, not to the underlying idea that you've come up with. The, the idea of painting the Golden Gate Bridge from underneath is not intellectual property that can be claimed by anyone. It's only the artist's own depiction of the bridge from that unique angle that's protectable. Any other artist can paint from the same location and claim the copyright in their unique expression of the same bridge. Does that make sense? Also, yeah. utilitarian items are not copyrightable. Utilitarian meaning a useful item. So a unique tool or a table lamp or a, a kitchen utensil design cannot be copyrighted. But if that design of a useful item is uniquely original, there's another intellectual property right that can be used to claim and protect the creator's 
IP, intellectual property interest in that design. That would be a patent. But I do want to distinguish between a, a, a unique lamp design and the, the use of a separate artistic expression in the useful item. If a, if a small sculpture can be used in making a lamp and can be physically and conceptually severed from the functioning item, that sculptural artistic expression is still eligible for copyright. Like, like the image of reproduced on a placemat or any product, the placemat is the useful item, but the image on it is copyrightable. Also, some other kinds of things that are not subject to copyright protection. Titles, phrases, names, these don't qualify for copyright protection, but may be entitled to the protection of another form of IP, trademarks. And trademarks are how brands are protected, how companies protect their names and can legally prevent anyone else from using the same or confusingly similar name in the same class of goods or services. I want to mention that if a logo, which is typically used as a trademark, if it has a unique artistic design, the logo may also qualify for copyright protection. So it will have dual IP protection. Next slide. Copyright has a constitutional, that is for those international uh, uh, attendees, a US constitutional origin. Under Article One, Section 8, um, the Constitution authorized the U.S. Congress to enact laws, quote, to promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. And the same thing applies to visual artists. In short, the Founding Fathers recognized that, that writers and artists of all kinds should have the right to a, a monopoly on their intellectual property so they could profit off them the same way that, that owners of real property profit from their ownership interests in, in land and houses and the like. Patents provide the same kind of title to the inventors of useful items, just like I talked about, and trademarks give their owners the exclusive right to use a brand name or logo in conjunction with their goods or services. So each of these intellectual property laws allow for a creator to hold exclusive rights, but only for a limited time and thus supporting the Jeffersonian notion of the free exchange of ideas. And that's for the benefit of the greater society so that other people can be inspired, not copy, but inspired to create their own works and hopefully make a living from their creative endeavors. So establishing these property rights of an artist serves to encourage creation of new works of art. Next slide, the, the copyright statute. So Bo, I have a question real fast. So yes. are you saying, do you see a lot of examples of artists who register their artwork under copyrights and then their name under trademark? Yes, that oh, okay. if, if their name serves as the origin of, of um, goods or services. Mm. So my belly dance client, uses her name for all of her services and courses and things. Because it's her brand. And that's her brand. Mm -hmm. And so she trade, trade we trademark her name for that purpose. So it is possible to have your own name uh, used as your trademark. But, okay. but when I say names, I'm talking about company names for the most part. Okay. Uh, and then images and sculpture, all of that, the copyright is for the artwork. Exactly. 
Great. Okay. okay. It's copyrighted when it's an expression. If it's a name or brand, it's trademark. Great. Thanks. Good distinction for for uh, for people to 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 um, uh, to register. Yeah. Because like a lot of people call me and they don't recognize or know the difference between the two, and 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 uh, so hopefully now it's it's clear for everyone. Yeah. Thank you for that. The uh, now the Copyright Act provides for specific listed exclusive rights, those of reproduction of the visual art, its distribution, its public performance and display, um, as well as the sole right of the copyright holder to make derivative works from their original work. This would include any kind of, 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 of other work or other kind of work based on the original. Uh, and it essentially, because it's, a, it's an exclusive right of the copyright holder, that establishes the right for the copyright holder, the artist, to license or even to sell the imagery, the copyright, in, in alternative forms. I also want all you artists to realize that these rights, at least under the U.S. law, belong to you as soon as your artwork comes into existence, whether it's a physical work or a digital one. However, there are some limits to these rights. One hot topic these days are works created by artificial intelligence. The position of the Copyright Office is that to be copyrighted, artworks have to be created by a human being. That rules out. AI generated works for copyright protection. However, artistic additions to something that has been generated by AI, those ad additions are going to be entitled to copyright protection. Another limit to exclusive distribution rights is the first sale doctrine. First sale doctrine is, is is part of the Copyright Act, it's section uh, 109A, and it, it cuts off the exclusive distribution right to an artwork once it's sold, the same way that books and records, once they're sold, can be resold. Now, until recently, California had a statute providing that fine artists had the right to receive 5% of the profit of the resale of their artworks by an original purchaser, as well as subsequent resellers. However, after a court challenge by the auction houses who didn't want to pay that 5% to artists, the federal courts in the US ruled that the California statute was preempted by this first sale doctrine and is no longer enforceable. However, there is a remedy. Artists can still include a right to a resale royalty in their sale agreement, if their buyer will agree to it. So you're saying it's really important then when you are selling a work of art, one, to establish who owns the copyright after it's sold, but two, if it's resold, that you are entitled, if you include and agree on it, you can be entitled to royalties from that reselling. Royalty. So, yeah. okay. Um, We'll, we'll talk more about the transfers and licensing momentarily. Okay. Uh, let's sli next slide. Let's go to, to, to notice and registration matters. The copyright notice is as simple as putting that copyright symbol, the circle letter C. Am I doing this backwards or forwards on the... <laughs> we get it. Um, I need a mirror to figure this one out. Um, so the, the letter C circle, the name of the copyright holder, and the year of its first publication. And that needs to be put somewhere on an artwork, wherever it's obvious. Now, if you're working with fine art, a lot of my clients don't want to put a copyright notice on the front. They consider it commercial or something. It's perfectly fine to put the copyright notice on the back of the canvas or even on the side of the frame or back of uh, um, uh, just somewhere where someone looking for that notice around the work 
will we be able to spot it? As for online website imagery, almost everybody you'll see has a copyright notice on the home page of their website that applies to all their works that are posted there. So that serves the same purpose of putting the copyright notice on your works. Now, registration of your copyright is not legally required, but it is a prerequisite if you're ever going to want to legally enforce your copyright interests here in the US. It's a relatively easy process now to register your copyrights online at the US Copyright Office. You can go to their website, it's www.copyright.gov. There are clear instructions provided and some really excellent step-by-step -step tutorials. The single author, single work application fee is presently $45, up from 35 just a few years ago, but that's inflation for you. Uh, but it's often possible to register a bunch of yet to be published works together for a higher fee of $85. But you might be able to do a whole year or a whole season's worth of images at a time for the single fee. If you've not properly registered your copyright interest before there's an illegal copying of your work, that is a copyright infringement, uh, you have to register anyway to bring the action. Once you register, again, if that infringement occurred before the registration, your damages, your monetary claim will be limited to the infringer's profits. Now, more often than not, an infringer has not made any profits from the use of someone else's copyrighted work. This is certainly true of personal online use. However, if you register your copyright before the infringement occurs or within three months of its original publication, you're allowed to elect statutory damages of up to $150,000 for an act of willful infringement instead of being limited to the infringer's profits. So this is a no brainer to do it because if you're infringed, you'll be able to bring an action and leverage that high risk to the infringer of a statutory damages award. And it's not just the statutory damages for which they'll be responsible. Um, they, the infringer will also be responsible to pay your attorney's fees the fees you've incurred because you've had to hire an attorney to pursue the infringement. But again, only if you have registered your copyright before that infringement occurs or within three months of its first publication. The effect is, the practical effect is, if one of my clients has an infringement claim, then I can say to them or their, their attorney, Look, it's going to cost your client tens of thousands of dollars just in the legal fees if this has to be pursued in court. Come on, let's let's settle this for something reasonable. And whether it includes a retroactive license or just a payment of a settlement amount, we almost always have it work it out without having to go to court. Now, the flip side of that is... Um, Many online infringers um, are given notice by there are these legal trolls out there who will send demand letters for posting for someone posting a copyrighted image on of someone else's on on your website without a license from the copyright holder. And these are legitimate claims and they'll threaten you with one hundred fifty thousand dollar damages. And it is sometimes difficult to, to negotiate a fair and reasonable settlement uh, uh, amount for this incidental use where you thought you were honoring someone else's work and it turned out you were also infringing it. 
Mm, that's that's something I haven't really thought about before. Yeah, think about it. Yeah. All right. Uh, next slide. Now, copyrights can also be transferred and sold. Uh, an artist's sale of their copyright is called an assignment. Look for that word in contracts. An assignment means effectively that you are selling your copyright, at least in a copyright IP context. If someone is wanting to sell their copyright or some, someone's wanting to buy it, it needs to be in writing. You can't legally convey a copyright interest without there being a writing to that effect. Now, renting out a copyright, I, I call it renting out, is accomplished by a license. A license of a copyright can be exclusive or non-exclusive. An exclusive license, like an assignment, has to be in writing. In the absence of a, such a writing, a license will legally be deemed non-exclusive. Now, copyright interests are also divisible, by which I mean that the various rights, like reproductions and derivative use, can be divvied up among different licensees for different lengths of time and for different places. For example, uh, poster rights to an image could be licensed non-exclusively nationally, while limited edition prints of the same image can be licensed to one gallery publisher exclusively. Or the same artist's original paintings can be consigned exclusively to different galleries in different cities, or non-exclusively to multiple galleries in the same city if the galleries agree. However, what I'm thinking of is the fact that you need to make sure that you do not license conflicting rights, like an exclusive license to one image to a, uh, a, a, a paper product manufacturer and a non-exclusive license to a greeting card company. The paper product manufacturer could claim that part of what you've licensed to them include greeting card rights. So your, your non-exclusive greeting card license would be a breach of your license, uh, your exclusive license to the manufacturer. Mm. I should mention, I uh, on my website, I have a blog, Bo's blog, which has about 20 or so uh, articles on licensing specifically. So if you want more detailed information on licensing, uh, I invite you to visit our website. Next slide. Ah, yeah, copy left. Now, a popular alternative to conventional copyright is the Creative Commons licensing management, which flips the traditional copyright notion of exclusive use by the owner. Instead, by using one of the CC notices, the copyright holder is telling the world they have permission to use that image as long as they give name credit to the original copyright holder and allow their own derivative works to be used or copied and altered by others. Now, in most cases, the use of a Creative Commons license allows for free derivative use, um, but only for limited purposes. The most commonly referenced Creative Commons license applies to all the content on Wikipedia. People who post on Wikipedia are consenting to the reuse of their original contributions, and readers are invited to reuse that material, but subject to crediting the source. If you scroll down to the bottom of any Wikipedia entry, you will see the CC license information and the Creative Commons link. But I taught you something there, Cassidy, didn't I? I I'm just, yeah, I, my jaw's <laughs> a little dropped. Uh, next uh, slide. Another limitation on copyright is its term. 
So how long does it last? Well, for the individual creator, copyright lasts for the life of the author plus 70 years. At least that's the way it's been since 1998. Prior to 1998, the term was the life of the artist plus 50 years under the 1976 Copyright Act. However, in 1998, Sonny Bono, oh, I bet most of you don't even know Sonny Bono, never mind. He got the copyright term extended for the benefit of Walt Disney and Company and for Mickey Mouse. I think the we Mouse, all know Mickey Mouse. The Mickey Mouse term was about to expire and the additional time that, that the legislation provided, the extra 20 years, gave Walt a reprieve but coincidentally, extended that term, the 20 year uh, term just ended as of this January 1st. So if you go online, you're gonna find that the earliest versions of Mickey Mouse that expired on January 1st of this year are being used and, and copied by a lot of other people and, and um, made use of in a way that, they, that the Disney company would have hammered with a cease and desist letter just last year. We have a bunch of people in the chat saying they know Sonny. Someone they, said Gen X here. <laughs> they know Sonny? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, We've got a lot of people that know. That's good because I didn't want to mark myself too old. <laughs> well, I represent I represent Sonny Bono's music producer who's still alive and, and um, still collecting royalties from, from um, uh, Sonny and Cher music. Just for wow. Anyway. All right. I want to talk about um, works made for hire by a company employee. Um, that term, the term is different. The term for work for employees and for the companies that they that they uh, do their creative work for, it's the shorter of ninety five years, uh, or the first public uh, excuse me ninety five years from the first publication or 120 years from the date of creation. So that's a distinction between the individual creator and the uh, work for hire, which I'm gonna be talking about, uh, uh, creation. Um, now, after these terms expire, or in the event that a, a given artist or writer doesn't claim a copyright interest, uh, those, creations, those artworks, are deemed to have passed into the public domain, another important term of art for you to keep in mind. Being in the public domain, or PD, means that anyone can use such works any way they choose, without any permission, without any license. But only new material that you add to the PD imagery is subject to a new copyright claim of right. So you can't re-copyright the public domain material, but you can your additions to it. Under the US Copyright Act, as of this year, any work originally published before 1929, that 95 year term that I mentioned, um, is now in the public domain. And as of January 1st of each year, that 95 year limit triggers another whole year of works falling into the PD. Next year, works that are first published in the US before 1930 will be in the public domain. And the following year, those published before 1931 will be in the public domain. There's even a, a, a website that that, that um, uh, uh, or an app maybe that shows all the, the works that were published in that year that has just expired. So there's a quick reference if you're interested in using old um, copyrighted works, many and famous now being available to you to alter or, or otherwise use. Andrew, I have a question real fast about is yes. this well, someone actually asked it, and I thought it was a great question. Um, does this mean if they they can renew the copyright, though, right? This no. is just, oh, you can't renew the copyright. No, 
No. Oh. Copyright renewal was something available under the 1909 Act. And some renewals between 1909 and 1978 were available. Uh, but um, the new terms are the new terms. And as things uh, expire, uh, they can't be renewed anymore. No. Interesting. Okay. At least not under the U.S. Uh, copyright law. And I should say that that not all um, copyright laws, national laws, are the same. And there are, uh, uh, like the registration process in the U.S. I, I think the U.S. is in the minority by having a registration process. Most countries, particularly in the European Union, I don't think they have registration process. But they, but you have your copyright and can bring the infringement right away. But internationally, I'll take it from the US perspective, the U US copyright holder can seek protection of an infringement of our right uh, in Europe or in another country under the laws of that country. That's what's established by the International Copyright Treaty, the, our convention, the Bern Switzerland Convention. So. It is, uh, I think there are 176 countries that are party to the Berne Convention. I might be off by one or two. And that means everybody is cooperating on the prospect of making claims in their respective countries by foreign nationals to enforce the copyright interests of the foreign national. Mm, okay. Um, before I finish with termination of, of copyright interest, I want to mention there's a special section of the Copyright Act, Section 203, which gives all copyright holders the right to recover their copyright that has been previously licensed um, if that license has been for as long as 35 years. But you have to, to, to do it through a two-year written notice process. So this doesn't terminate your copyright, but it terminates the license that someone else has in it. So you can get your rights back, particularly if they're not the, the person who to whom you assigned or licensed these rights is no longer making any use of it and you want them back. So that's a very handy provision to use um, that, that few people know about. Yeah. Wow. We like that. We like getting our rights back. Get your rights back, but you have to be over well, 35 years at least. <laughs> but but okay. maybe some of, of, of your uh, finger painting is an infant. That <laughs> uh, all right. So uh, next slide. Let's talk about works made for hire. Um, again, a, it's important for artists to understand what a, a work made for hire is and, and the importance of that term of art. In short, when artwork is prepared or commissioned as work for hire, the copyright does not belong to the artist creator, but to the employer of the artist. So you don't own the copyright when you're doing work as an employee or as work for hire. Um, and most often what you will have, you'll find the work for hire language when you are asked to do a specially commissioned work, graphic design or whatever, and in that written agreement, there will be a provision that says your work is being provided as work made for hire. Work made for hire, unless you're in an employee-employer relationship, as an independent contractor, work for hire has to be in writing. So that's what that's about. It's about your transfer of your license, excuse me, of your copyright rather than licensing your rights to the person who commissions your work. Now, I would say, and, and I talk about this in my contracts webinar, you don't have to agree to work for hire. You can often give all the rights that the, the person needs through exclusive licensing. So, don't feel obligated to agree to a work for hire provision if there's a workaround, and there often is. 
Um, going back to contracts for a second, it, I'm reminded that uh, often if, if in that same independent contractor agreement, if it says that uh, for any reason that the, that the work for hire doesn't apply, that the artist or the, the, the service provider will assign their interests in the copyright to the person who has hired them. And we all now know what that assignment means. It means a sale of the copyright. So the, again, the language of the work for hire provision typically looks to provide work for hire rights, uh, uh, um, looks to provide transfer of the copyrights uh, to the person who hired you, unless you change that language. If you are gonna sell the copyright, I would add, it should be much more expensive than if you're just licensing rights. So that's mm -hmm. another position that you can take on negotiating those contracts. Um, next slide. I've just been talking about this distinction but being, being an employee uh, or an independent contractor. And occasionally it's not clear you know, what your status is when you're asked or commissioned to do these types of, of um, uh, provide these kinds of services. Now, traditionally, the issue of whether you have been engaged as an independent contractor or as a, uh, an employee was determined by the factors of a 1989 art case called Community of Creative Nonviolence versus Reed. Now that case was a, a dispute over a copyright to a sculpture, sculptor's uh, homeless nativity scene in, in Washington, DC. Um, the Reed factors, that's the name of the case, are listed here on the PowerPoint. Basically, employee status factors all relate to the means and manner of control. The more control over the project, if held by the creator rather than the employer, the more likely the creator will be deemed an independent contractor and not an employee. And these are the skill required, the source of the tools, the location of the work, all those that are listed here. Um, probably, probably the most important ones are whether um, you know, you, you've got your own business and you're using your own contracts and you're negotiating your own terms. Those are all important indicia of an independent contractor status. And of course, what I'm talking about here is that we want to avoid the error that somebody has employed you as an empl in an employer employee status. And you think you're working as an independent contractor and retaining your, your copyright interests. But because um, uh, perhaps uh, the, the state and others and the employer are paying you as an employee, they have a reasonable expectation that they'll own the fruit, all the fruits of your labor, the, those copyright interests. Um, I want to touch on the next sli slide, um, the, the AB5 legislation in California enacted in, in 2019. Um, given our national and international audience today, suffice it to say that in California and other select states, artists who have historically been given an independent contractor gig worker status may now legally by the state be deemed employees. So if you are hired as an employee because your state law requires you to have to, to, to be an employee, and get the benefits of an employee, work comp, unemployment insurance, payroll taxes, unless you take special steps in writing to retain the copyright interest for yourself, they will belong to the employer. Cutting edge stuff here. Next slide, joint works. Um, you can also own a copyright with other people. A joint work is one prepared by two or more authors, quote, 
with the intention that their contributions be merged into inseparable interdependent parts of a unitary whole, end quote. This makes it particularly important for collaborating artists to have a written agreement addressing their respective rights to copyright and works as joint owners. Um, essentially, in the absence of a agreement between collaborators, each joint copyright owner has a key to the same car. Either one can drive that car off and possibly over a cliff in the absence of an agreement on how they intend to jointly or how they intend to use the jointly owned copyright. However, in the absence of an express agreement, if one owner does profit by their use of the joint work, that owner is legally obligated to share any profits equally with their joint copyright owners. Next, 14, <clears throat> excuse me. I have a slide. question. So is so that, that group work where, you know, you have multiple artists on one piece of art, uh, you know, it's a collaboration. Anyone who is working on that piece has equal rights to it. What the, if the, one the agreement, goes- The agreement yeah. needs to address that. That needs, that's, yeah. has to be discussed among people. Um, you know, with bands, uh, some of them may be copyright participants, some of them won't. The agreement controls. Right. And that's okay. why it's important to have, um, to know what you're doing with, with, with written agreements and as possible to obtain a, a, an attorney to help you with it. And the places like California Lawyers for the Arts here and Volunteer Lawyers for the Arts in other states will fix you up with an attorney who knows these issues and, and can assist at low cost or pro bono. Amazing. All right, I'm gonna pick it up here because we're running out of time, aren't we? <laughs> Let's do it. Um, next slide, infringement. To prove that a copyright interest has been infringed, the artist plaintiff must prove only three things. First, that they own a valid registered copyright. Two, that the protected expression, um, the protectable expression um, has been accessed by the other party, by the defendant and that there is a substantial similarity between what the defendant created and your original work. Now, these days, copyrighted imagery is all over the internet, and original works are easily accessed and copied. But just because an artist's work is online, to prove an infringement, there must be some evidence that their work was seen by the alleged infringer, regardless of the fact that the infringing work may well be substantially similar. That said, most online infringements can be stopped with a takedown letter to the platform that's publishing the infringing work. Social media platforms are protected by the safe harbor provision of the Digital Millennial Copyright Act. You'll see the letters DMCA. The terms of use referenced in the website on the platform tell you how to report an infringement and how to prove your rights as the copyright holder, if the infringer disputes your claim. If the platform fails to remove the infringing work, it risks being liable as a defendant along with the infringer in a copyright infringement claim. Now, with respect to substantial similar burdens of proof, consider this next slide, the Golden Gate Bridge photos. This is the same subject matter, obviously, the same location, lighting, so the shots are obviously substantially similar. But this is most likely a coincidence. There are hundreds of shots like this. Many artworks are similar. Each are entitled to their own copyright, as long as they did not access and copy a prior copyrighted work. In summary, it's it's all right to be inspired by someone else's copyrighted work to create your own. Just make sure that yours is not so substantially similar to the copyrighted work that a jury could say that it that yours is so substantially similar that you could not have created it 
unless it was you based yours upon theirs. That's that's essentially the 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 jury instruction on copyright infringement claims for substantial similarity. But there are also defenses to infringement claims. Let's jump on them. Next slide. First, I want to emphasize that lack of knowledge that your use is infringing is not a defense to infringement. Lack of knowledge with a reasonable belief that reuse was permissible without a license may be relevant to the amount of damages that can be awarded against you as an innocent infringer under the Copyright Act. Defenses to infringement claims that can succeed, though, um, include that the use was actually licensed. The owner just didn't know that you had obtained a license from a licensee of theirs, like Getty Images. A statute of limitation and fair use. Um, the statute of limitation refers to the three year time limit to bring a lawsuit after discovering an infringement. If you fail to do so, it will legally bar your claim. Although, if the infringer is continually using your work, then it might establish new consecutive three year terms but your damages are limited to just the past three years. The most common defense is fair use. Now, fair use is has a four-factor legal test that are used by the courts to decide whether or not an infringing work, or let's call it a substantially similar work, is or is not privileged because of the fair use factors. There's no right answer that can be given ahead of time. The test has to be applied in each new fact situation in courts. The first of the four factors <clears throat> is the purpose and character of defendants, the defendant infringer's use. Is that use commercial? Is it nonprofit? Is it parody? Is it criticism? Is it comment? For purposes such as criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, scholarship research, these are constitutional First Amendment free speech rights. So there are so these are legitimate for fair use purpose, but but the use is still subject to the other three factors. The second is the nature of the copyrighted work. Is it a creative work or an informational work? Is it a published work or had it yet to be published? The more creative, the less likely the infringement is likely to be fair use. Unlicensed publication of an unpublished novel is likely to be very damaging and thus less a fair use to the, to the author of the manuscript. The third factor is the amount of the work copied relative to the whole underlying copyrighted work. Think of it this way, for criticism and comment, does the whole copyright work have to be used for that purpose or just limited amounts? So even under the first comment and criticism fair use factor, if they did the whole work, a whole poem, when they only needed one or two lines, that can still be infringing because they use too much under factor three. That leads directly to the fourth factor. What is the effect upon the market for the original underlying work? And will, will the, has the infringing work damaged that market for the copyright holder? This may be the most important factor these days when among cases in court. Does the infringing use damage the copyright holder's sales prospects for their own work. Next slide. Transformative works and parody. The, the other significant free speech fair use purpose that's been subject to a lot of copyright litigation is when the copyrighted work is used for the purpose of parody, making fun of the original work. Not satire, 
which is using the copyrighted work to make some comment about society as a whole rather than the artwork itself. But parody. Parody refers specifically to the original work and makes fun of it. It makes fun of the original work using only so much of it as is necessary to make the point. Bo, I'm going to just take a brief moment. We are at ah! an hour. I know. Um, I just want to let everyone know that we are going to stay on a few minutes longer to be able to take some questions and finish up the slides. But if you have to go, thank you so much for joining. We are going to send the oh, go. Gonna, we are going to send the recording regardless. So even if I want to be respectful of everyone's time, because I know we said we are going to stick to an hour, but I just want to let you know that we're not leaving just yet. So if you have time, stay on, um, and we'll keep going through the slides. So I just wanted to let everyone know that before we. Uh, get to the hour mark. And okay. I apologize for running over, but this is <laughs> too good to miss. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, in the, uh, uh, I, I'm talking about transformative fair use. And with respect to the original transformation cases, it, the, the first, I guess, was, was when um, 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 Two Live Crew, the rappers, um, uh, used Pretty Woman by Roy Oberson at the start of, of their version of the song. Uh, they used the first several bars of, of Orb <clears throat> Orbison's Pretty Woman. And this went all the way to the Supreme Court of the U.S. And it was deemed to be transformative, fair use parody, since the song created something completely new while using just enough of the original song to make fun of it. Parody. A good visual art example of a work that's deemed infringing and not parody is the 1992 case of the photographer Art Rogers against the sculptor Jeff Koons. Let's look at the evidence. Next slide. The court rejected Koons' fair use as parody because Koons was not commenting on Rogers' work specifically. And so his copying of that work did not fall under the fair use exception. Coons didn't dispute that he had seen the original photograph. It's pretty indisputable, isn't it? But so it's, and it's obviously substantially similar. I'm reminded of a similar kind of case, a, a case about O.J. Simpson's highway chase that was done in the style of, of Dr. Seuss and made fun of O.J., but not of Dr. Seuss. So the OJ book was deemed to be a copyright infringement. I mentioned this today in honor of OJ, who, if you have not heard, passed away today. An example of a visual artwork deemed transformative fair use is the Annie Leibovitz case against Paramount. Next slide. The naked gun poster of Leslie Neal's face on the body of a pregnant nude Demi Moore photo by Annie Leibovitz is obvious parody. The purpose of the work was to make fun of a serious artistic photograph. The nature of the work was highly a highly creative poster. Um, a while a substantial amount of the original was used, it only heightens the ridiculous nature of the parody. And, uh, and there's no negative effect on Leibovitz's limited edition prints market. So she was not financially damaged by this infringing use. Now, following the Leibowitz case, there have been a whole line of cases that have ruled that if an artwork alters a pre-existing copyrighted work sufficiently to transform the original into something completely new, then the fair use defense could apply. However, if I've been telling my clients, including one collage artist, Fair use is only a defense to an infringement claim, not a bar. So whether her use of other artists, artists copyrighted works in her collages will be deemed transformative, it'll be up to a jury and the jury's instructions that a given judge will devise. She will already have to spend tens of thousands defending the claim and a judgment against her could sufficiently uh, uh, bankrupt her and cause her to, to have to pay the plaintiff's attorney's fees as well. 
I would say judging one's own artwork to be sufficiently transformative as to prevail on a copyright infringement case is simply too risky. Not to mention the dishonor to the perspective of the other artists whose copyrighted works are being used. Get a permission. That's my advice. Um, I'm going to jump to uh, AI to conclude my comments. Um, it is transformative fair use that artificial intelligence has been claiming as their defense to the use of copyrighted works in the input, the in the the uh, um, the data that the AI companies are saying they're collecting before generating a new work. Um, what copyright attorneys are discovering, like those at the, the New York Times and, and like those for Billie Eilish's, is that if a user asks for output that looks or sounds similar to something that the artist has published, it's likely to be substantially similar because the algorithms having accessed everything not just one artist's work, uh, make the out mean must um, must that output be deemed transformative? Uh, I think not. As we speak, there are various bills in Congress looking to address artists' claims against the onslaught of, onslaught of AI right now. Um, California Congressman Adam Schiff just this week uh, introduced a bill that would compel. AI companies to provide a list of all the copyrighted works, what their techies call their, their data input, uh, that were drawn upon to generate a given AI product. With identification of the source material, artists will be that much closer to having a right to share in the profits of the use of their copyrighted works, or alternatively, to potentially bar AI from using their copyright, copyrighted works. And this, this is really the, the, the latest frontier of copyright law. I think I will end on that note. We'll skip that last slide and I'll see if I can't address some questions real quick. Okay, thank you so much. Again, like I said in the beginning, we realized that we had so much to cover. We could break it up into multiple webinars, but we wanted oh, to give you as much. Cassidy, oh, yeah? just because you kept interrupting me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He had a really tight 50 minutes and I just kept coming in with these questions. But we have so many questions. Obviously, we do not have time to answer all of them, but we will try and uh, come to, we'll create, an, you know, more webinars or articles with a lot of the covering a lot of the themes that we find in the questions um and we'll also uh send you answers and send you uh, more links and resources in the follow-up okay i'm gonna ask bo so we had a bunch of questions around making art based on either an image you took of a celebrity or an image of someone else of influence you know do you need their permission is that okay? Um, what, how, what are, what's the answer to that? Well, I, I'm, I'm going to go out on the ledge here and, and say the answer to that is generally, generally, yes. You know, you can do a creative work of a, of a, a celebrity or, or a, uh, um, a, a, a person in the uh, public sphere um, because um, you are because of your First Amendment rights, you're a creative artist. This is what you do. Here's your depiction of them. Now, I will hedge that with a caveat and say that the right of publicity is a, st a state statute. It differs from state to state to state. Um, people may have seen that Tennessee which already had the most protective um, uh, 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 right of publicity statute. Why? Because Elvis Presley's from Memphis and they wanna protect 
the Elvis Enterprise um, uh, company. So any depictions of Elvis risk a claim under Tennessee law that, hey, you didn't have the permission of, <clears throat> of Elvis Presley Enterprises. So there are these risks, but um, there's also the argument of free speech as a defense to that. Um, just this week, ten, or, or this month, Tennessee expanded on that by uh, making sound-alike um, voices a, a, a restriction under the right of publicity. Um, to honor the, the person, you know, you, you, you best go to their agents and or their estates and mm -hmm. request permission and be prepared to pay a license. Certainly if you're going to do not just one portrait, let's say, but, but try and make posters or some other commercial product that's featuring that image. I think that's where you cross the line and will likely need to obtain a license from the, uh, from the celebrity business enterprises. Okay, and what about images that you just find, you know, someone said that they're painting birds and they use images they find online of different birds. Is that okay? Uh, no, I mean, those those images online apply, ha have their own copyrights and, and could well be um, subject to, could subject your use to, to uh, of their imagery to, to an outright willful infringement claim. Um, now there are, some general rules about, about flora and fauna um, that say, look, it's very difficult to draw plants more specifically in different ways. So there's less protection afforded to, um, to flora and fauna than there are to other um, uh, creative depictions of, 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 um, of things and other than people. <laughs> Okay, another question. Does the copyright begin when I officially copyright it or the date the work was creating? And similarly, when copywriting a website, do I put the year that it was first created or the current year? Um, my advice on, I, I have actually answered the first one. It's upon creation, you have a copyright. Um, as for the second part of the question, I encourage people to put copyright from the first year, from 2014 through 2024. Mm. And that way you're capturing all the imagery that you would have put up there, as well as text and design and other elements that are copyrightable through the whole term of, of the ev evolution of the website. Amazing. And then uh, we have a bunch of questions around people have been making work for decades. They have not copyrighted any of them. Is there a way to copyright work in bulk? They're, they're copyrighted. They're oh, well, copyrighted. true, true. They were copyrighted yes. upon creation. The question is, um, if it was before 1978, in the absence of a copyright notice, they would have, by statute, be in the, tub in the public domain. Or... Um, after 89, you don't even need a copyright notice to have your copyright. It's just a question of enforcing your rights needing to have registered. That makes sense? That makes a lot of sense. Okay. Yes. Um, another question that I was seeing a lot that I was really interested in was, what if you inherit artwork? um by a family member all right well we're talking about the physical objects there and yeah. those are distinct from the copyright the intellectual property interest though is also to, um, um, subject to the laws of inheritance and many people forget that and they and they write a will and they say you know my house and my money but usually the will, has a catch-all provision that says, and anything else I own. Well, their copyrights, to the extent that the decedent has copyrights, will also go through 
the residuary clause or as particular gifts. For my artist clients who want to make sure that 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 the estate or or a trust will continue to maintain and license and 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 work and generate income for their heirs, um, there's a copyright estate or often run by what's known as a literary executor. And I serve as literary executor to a few estates and we continue to, to uh, grant licenses in the copyrighted works, generate royalties and pass those on to the heirs year to year. Mm. So ultimately what I'm hearing too is you just need to find a great lawyer. <laughs> Uh, you don't even need a great one. Just someone who knows what to do. <laughs> yes. Uh, okay. We are at 12 or my time is 12 coming up to 15. Uh, I am going to close us out with just a reminder. I know. Thank you so much, Bo, for breaking so much of this information down. It, you know, I feel like I'm going to be ruminating on a lot of things that you talked about and want to go through the recording all over again. Uh, again, we're going to share it. We're going to share the slides. Also, I'm going to share, you know, how to get in touch with Bo if you need to contact him. Um, again, you know, if you're an Artwork Archive user, there's so many ways that you can use an inventory platform to keep track of your artwork, your imagery when it's created. Um, and you can get a free for a uh, free trial, no strings attached for two weeks. We'll send you a link to that as well if you want to try it out. What a deal. I know. Two weeks. Try it out. Uh, and we host webinars like this all the time because most of our team are filled is filled with artists. We really care about artists and we want everyone to feel empowered um, to have the tools that you need to have a successful art career. Uh, I want to again, thank you, Bo. Thank you, everyone, for taking an hour and 15 minutes out of your day. And I hope you have a really great rest of your day. Tune in. We'll have more webinars like this. Bye. Thank you, Cassidy.